Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this month's World Services for the Blind webinar. As this is National Guide Dog Month, we decided that would be a really fun topic to focus on today, and I think everybody will be interested in hearing what our speakers have to say. I'm joined here by TJ Hunt, our Certified Orientation and Mobility Specialist. She works with our clients here on our campus in Little Rock teaching orientation and mobility. And we're also going to be joined by Angela McDwyer from the Seeing Eye. She's a, their senior admissions, admissions officer. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about the process of applying for and training with a guide dog if you're interested. So before we get into that, though, I'm going to let TJ start first talking a little bit about traditional white cane orientation mobility and how you can find training for that. TJ. So yeah, um, I'm gonna, um, I'm not sure exactly what our whole audience is today. Um, do, are most of you, and I guess you can unmute just to kind of say yes or no, but are most of you uh, adults or family, friends of adults that are on the webinar today? Can you just unmute and give a yes or no? Are there any of you, I guess I'm looking for, is there anybody here that is a family or friend of, or in high school? Uh, we have a, uh, hi, this is Matt Libertor. We have a very, very young uh, visually impaired son. And I'm here mostly just to learn about potential for the future. So not even high school yet. Okay, perfect. That's okay. I just want to know who we're talking to. So we have an idea. It kind of helps us to know where we're like, what, what uh, we're looking at. So that helps to know that. Perfect. Anybody Hi, else? My name is and I am in my mid forties and I am extremely vision impaired. And okay. I'm just looking for other assistance. Perfect. And if anyone doesn't want to unmute themselves, you can feel free to put it in the chat. Um, and also, if you have any questions, you can feel free to leave them in the chat. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, so for as far as getting orientation and mobility instruction, um, as, as far as an adult, the way you're going to go, one would go about doing that is through your vocational rehab services counselor. Um, you can contact your state VR counselor and let them know that you need, want, uh, have a desire to receive orientation and mobility, and they can get that provided to you um, through their services. Uh, through some states, those services are contracted. Some states, those services are uh, employees of the state. So the, but those services are done through the state, through your VR counselors. And you do want to, um, I'm sorry, let me go back and say that those services are provided to you at your uh, need or on your need, at, at your level or need. So if you need them at home, if you need to go to the grocery store, if you need to learn how to ride a bus, those orientation and mobility skills are provided to you or can be provided to you on, at that level. Um, if you are newly blind and you need orientation and mobility because you don't know how to get outside of your home because you've always gotten around as a sighted person and now you need to learn how to use a cane or even not use a cane, just learn how to maneuver your environment, um, you can even get orientation and mobility instruction at that level and not have to use a cane, um, just learning how to get in around your environment. As someone who's in school, so at the family who they've got a young child, your services will come through the school system. So uh, you just need to contact your school through the IEP system, you, your services will be provided as an IEP service. So um, you just need to contact your, if you have a vision teacher, you need to let that vision teacher know that you would be interested in orientation and mobility services. Um, but those services are provided as a, um, as a secondary service through the IEP. Um, 
So the um, so you can also receive those. <clears throat> uh, everyone can use orientation and mobility. Doesn't matter what your vision level is. If you've got low vision, if you have no vision. I believe that everyone can use orientation mobility. I believe that if you have um, additional disabilities, you can use orientation mobility because you, you still have to get around. So we need to learn how to get from point A to point B. And so orientation mobility is gonna help you be able to do that. Um, I did bring a few canes today just to show you the difference in uh, just a few different canes that we have. Uh, available so you have some idea um, some basic canes there's also um, there there are more I just brought some basic ones so the first one I'm going to show you and I don't know how well you'll be able to see these I know some of you are visually impaired so I will uh, just talk about it the first one I have up today is a rigid cane what we call a rigid cane this is a straight cane it does not bend it doesn't fold it is straight as an arrow um, this particular one is probably, if I had to guess, it's made out of aluminum. Um, it has a grip at the top of it, uh, a long shaft, and it has a, uh, it has a, yeah, I'm sorry for hitting <laughs> you in the face. It has a tip at the bottom. Uh, and so this is a rigid cane. Uh, most adults don't use rigid canes. Uh, let me go back and say many adults don't use rigid canes. A lot of smaller children use rigid canes, um, but we, they are available. The next cane that I have to show you is an NFB cane. This is, uh, these are available from NFB, National Federation of the Blind. You can receive at least one a year for free by contacting NFB um, and they'll send it to you for free. This cane is also rigid. It doesn't fold, it doesn't bend. Uh, this cane is made out of fiberglass um, and it's got, again, it has a grip at the top. It is a long shaft and then at the bottom it has a, a metal tip on it. Um, and so this is an NFB cane. Like I said, you can get an NFB cane for free once, at least once a year by contacting NFB. And then I have a folding cane here. So this cane is folded. It has an elastic strap in the middle of the cane, so it folds up. I'd like to say it can go in your pocket. It cannot, <laughs> unless you have a very deep pocket. Um, but this particular one folds into four sections. And so when it unfolds, it becomes a long cane. It has a grip like a golf grip, the shaft which folds up, and then a tip on the end. This particular tip is a marshmallow tip. Uh, it's just round and looks like a marshmallow, um, but it just folds up. You just pull on the elastic band and fold it at each of the joints. And then it has this other elastic band that wraps around the joints to hold it together. And you can carry it. You can put it down next to your chair. You can put it underneath your seat in the car. So it folds up nicely to store. Um, many people prefer the folding cane because it's more, it allows for easier storage. Um, but the thing that I will caution you about in one of our, uh, our instructors here is very big on is your cane does not go on the table. Uh, it is just like a shoe. It's on the floor, it hits lots of things, lots of dirty things. And if you don't put your shoes on the table, you don't put your cane on the table. Uh, because who knows what it has picked up off of the floor. So just side note, think about that the next time you put your cane on the table. Um, so uh, those are our typical canes that we use. We also have, at least here at WSB, we have support canes that sometimes we provide to our clients because we have elderly clients or some clients that have some support issues. So we do have um, white canes that are for support. This happens to be a support cane. Uh, it just is a, a shorter uh, cane that goes up to your 
hip. You can provide, you can, have, you can use it for support as a rubber tip. Um, and then we have a four prong support cane as well. So this has four prongs on the bottom and it's for support as well. Um, and so those are just canes that are available. We try not to do a lot with support canes because as an orientation and mobility specialist, I work on using a cane for mobility, not for support. Physical therapy really is here, is who works for, on support, orientation and mobility. We are more interested and in our experience and knowledge comes from mobility, not support the support aspect of someone's physical uh, abilities. Uh, so that's what we have for orientation and mobility. That's a short so one. I know you mentioned that there were a couple of different types of tips on the end of those canes that you were talking about. Can you talk briefly about why someone might prefer one type of tip over another? Yeah, so I didn't bring tips with me, but with, there's several different kinds of tips. There's a pencil tip, a, uh, these canes have, I have a pencil tip, a marshmallow tip, a metal tip, there's a roller tip, there's a disc roller tip, um, there is a, uh, there's a tip called a Dakota something tip, can't remember the total name of that one, and then there's a large ball tip, uh, and there's more. Those are the ones that I know of off the top of my head. Um, a different tip gives different information. So as you're using the cane, you get different feedback from a different tip on the cane. Uh, some people have a uh, preference to a tip. So if a person who has always used an NFB cane, NFB canes only come with a metal tip. And so if you've always been an NFB cane user and then you switch to using a folding cane, you may prefer the, net, the metal tip because that's the only tip you've ever had. And so we can put a metal tip on a folding cane. Um, some people like to always use constant contact, which is to keep their cane on the ground at all times when they're, when they're traveling. And so if that's the case, I will typically give that, those individuals a roller tip because it has it has ball bearings in it and it rolls uh, as you travel with it and it just moves a little bit more smoothly. Um, if you're in a rural area, a large ball tip is a little more efficient because it rolls over things, uh, rocks, gravel, grass, a little bit easier than some of the other tips that are available. Uh, if you are a um, proficient cane user and you use two point touch, uh, you would most likely use a pencil tip because it's lightest. It's going to be what um, it's not going to get as stuck in things. You're it, it's going to be the easiest to use if you're using two point touch, uh, which is where you're going to pick your cane up as you move through the environment. Is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. That makes so. I know. For me, I've had better luck with some tips versus yeah. others, depending on the terrain yeah. that you're in. Right. So, and I like for my clients to be able to, and even I've worked in the school system for a long time, and I like my students, I like my adult clients uh, to be able to try multiple tips mm -hmm. and decide which one they like best. And I try to put a tip on a cane and let them use it for two or three days a week and then come back and, and say yes or no, and then try a different one and decide if, which one they like. And it's funny because some people will come back immediately and say, nope, don't like that tip, give me a different one. Um, I, I just remember there's also another one, a ceramic tip, which is new to me it, recently, um, which people do like because it gives some good feedback on the ground and it doesn't wear down because it's made of ceramic. So. Um, but yeah, so it's real interesting what people like, what preferences different people have. Sure. So, yeah. so in the course of working with clients, do you ever um, speak with people about whether they should continue with their cane mobility or if maybe a dog would be a good choice for them? Absolutely. 
Um, especially when I see clients or have clients that are very proficient cane users. Um, when I have clients who are very proficient cane users and or clients who I know uh, travel an extensive amount, I will talk to them about dogs and using a dog guide. Um, and um, I never push anybody into that area, but I do uh, talk to clients about dog guides and, and what the process is to obtain a dog guide. Uh, and then we have here at, uh, at World Services, we have a list of all those schools in the United States that are dog guide schools that someone can contact uh, each of the schools and determine for themselves which one is the best fit for them. So from your perspective and experience, what do you think are some of the most important considerations someone should make when they're factoring in whether a dog that would be an option for them? So I don't, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna sort of push that question over to Angela and let her give some of that, what's the most important parts of that. Um, I think that as far as the, what I tell clients is they need to have good orientation skills because the dog doesn't know where you're going. So if they don't have good orientation skills from the beginning, I don't, I'm not going to say I don't encourage them not to get a dog or to get a dog, but we discuss the orientation skills way more than we discuss mobility skills. Because if you can't get out of a paper bag, your dog's not going to get you out of it. Either. <laughs> so, um, so that's very important. Um, but I'm going to let Angela talk sure. a little bit more about like, the importance of what you need to do and know and what, what's more important as far as getting a dog and how. Cool. Well, that's a perfect segue. Um, I'd like to introduce Angela McGuire again. She's from the same eye. Um, Angela, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your organization? Hi, everyone. I'm Angela McDyer. I'm in the admissions and graduate service area of our organization. Uh, the Seeing Eye is the oldest guide dog school in the U.S. And um, we serve students across the country and also in Canada. Um, and I have to agree totally your mobility skills orientation is the primary need um, and you have to be proficient um, because exactly how she mentioned, you know, you're taking a dog that's never been in your area and you are going to work them in that area and you need to be the leader of the pack. You lead them and they keep you safe. Um, so one of the main requirements for our school and many guide dog schools is to have solid mobility and orientation skills so that we know that you can take this, this pup and be able to utilize it and be very safe and successful, not only in your area, but wherever you travel, um, whether it be in your area, it could be internationally, anywhere, um, so that we know that you're going to be safe. Um, so for our organization, a uh, majority of the students that apply, they've learned from a graduate who's had a guide dog from our school and also a uh, mobility specialist, orientation mobility specialist will send people our way when they feel that the student would be able to handle this type of um, mobility. Uh, you have to realize too that it's a responsibility. You're taking care of another living being. And it is totally different than a cane travel. Cane travel, as you noticed, is detecting things. When you have a guide dog, you are the, the dog takes you around and avoids those obstacles. So that's why you really have to know where you're going and do what you're, you know, have your routine and set um, patterns because that way you know that you can lead that dog in a very comfortable way. Um, and then third, people will call, everybody goes on the internet now, you know, you can check on websites, right? And then you, and you compare. And I find that guide dog mobility uh, 
most people will say, you know what, I checked the different schools. It's almost like if you're applying to colleges in a sense, I've got more people who apply to multiple places than they used to in the past. Um, and each organization is going to have something a little bit more for what they're looking for. Um, we're a school that works on praise with our dogs. So just like people, if somebody compliments you, you feel very good about it. Um, when a dog gets you across that street or does something good, we ask you to make sure you just stop and praise that dog and the dog will be like, all right, you wanna go do this again? Let's do it, you know? Um, <laughs> so that's, that's what it's all about. Um, so the process is basically, if you've had um, never had a dog or you've had dogs from other schools, you apply and, and it's different steps to the process. Our goal is to find out, number one, what's your skill set? Do you have enough need for a dog? Um, you need to be active every day and go places. It doesn't mean that you have to be taking mass transportation and flying places. Everybody has a routine and they have a need to get around, just like I get in my vehicle and I need to get to work. I need to go to the supermarket. These dogs help each individual do their necessities to keep them going. Um, we love when people get um, life skills and orientation because it really gets them ready for the life here. Um, when you go through the process and you come to our school, you're residing in an unknown territory and we wanna make sure that you feel very comfortable when you're here. This becomes like your second home while you're away. Um, so we wanna make sure that you can handle all of those things and that, you'll go home with a dog very successfully. Um, so the steps, basically, do you want me to go through the steps of the process or how would you like to do it? Yeah, absolutely. If you could just go through kind of the admissions process if someone decided that they did want to look into getting a dog, that'd be great. Sure. A lot of questions we get, do you have to be totally blind to have a vision, you know, like a dog? And no, you don't need to be totally blind. You can have light perception, you have partial, but we're really pretty particular. You can't have too much vision for the fact that you can override what the dog is doing. Um, vision is a strong sense, it truly is. It takes over. Um, so what we need to know is that this individual, no matter what type of um, vision they have, if it's a little bit more, can handle handle that and let the dog do its job. Um, when I mentioned that, it could be say, maybe there's a car that's gonna be coming and turning. And as you know, cars today are a lot more silent than they used to be. The dog might stop and prevent that person from going. But if the person says, wait, 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 I wanna keep going, you know, and not listen to the dog, you can get into harm's way. Or if you have too much vision, what could end up happening is um, the dog says, well, she's got it covered. I don't really need to do this anymore. I'm just going to go for the ride. And then that's not good either because then it becomes a situation that a safety issue. So we review vision reports and also we ask the applicant a little bit more about what they personally perceive and we analyze that. Um, so we collect a lot of information. That's one step. We, re we ask for three references and we always ask for an orientation mobility specialists, um, a letter from them. We don't have a checklist form. We have something that we ask for each specialist to provide their point of views in regards to their mobility. How do they cross streets? How do they problem solve um, their area, their home? We wanna make sure that this is going to be a very safe, comfortable home for one of our dogs. We wanna make sure that when they get there, that this dog is going to blossom in this type of environment. And the two of them will start getting to be one unit. Because just like any relationship, you know, after the class is done, it's still going to be a lot of growth and, and problem solving time when you get back home in your area. Now you're in your domain, but the dog doesn't know anything about it. So you have to lead the way. And then through practice and constantly working together, you start working as one unit. Um, and that's, that's wonderful. I love to get those phone calls. Usually happens around six months. Um, each one is different. Uh, when they say you should have seen us today, it was definitely like, 
what you mentioned, because I always tease people, it's like dancing with the stars. You start practicing and you're stepping on each other's toes. You're uncertain. Trust is huge, right? You have to trust going across a street, um, getting into places where you've never been before. Um, and then you start trusting. And then these these dancers, right, they, they move around smoothly like one unit. And that's what it's supposed to be all about. Um, so going back with the process, what we do is we collect that information. Um, if somebody has any other type of impairment, maybe there is some sort of uh, a hearing impairment. We like to understand that too. Um, primarily to make sure that they can do some good traffic judgments and they feel pretty comfortable. Um, and also with that, what we try to do is understand if somebody is a little bit weaker on the left or the right, because once we do take the application to the next step, we personally visit each individual, each candidate in their area. We wanna see where they live, we wanna see what they do, and we wanna make sure if somebody has any type of hearing impairment that we can talk to them on the correct side, right? You wanna make that person as comfortable as possible. Um, so same thing here, if everyone gets accepted and they come into class, we let the entire, even the um, serving staff, everybody know about that individual so that when they're talking to them, they can really hear them and feel respected. Um, so if somebody has a certain kind of gait um, a very, um, uh, like something like they have a prosthetic, we try to get as much information on that as well. So after we collect all that information, we've visited, they write up a report and somebody gets approved for the program. Then what we do is we, and we accept them into our school and then they populate a list of students that are waiting to be served. Um, we serve about, 220 to 250 students in a year. Um, our program consists of classes every single month. Our school um, still has a four week program for new students and a three week program for students coming back for a successor dog. Um, sometimes we play around with the, the type of instruction if we need to, we accommodate a little bit. Um, if somebody needs to get home and they, and they have a tough area, if it's a retrain, we'll do um, some training at home. Um, if somebody who is a retrain has had numerous dogs, but right now the rigor of the class is too much, we'll provide home instruction. Um, but when you're in class, it's pretty rigorous. You're getting up pretty early. We feed you all your meals. Uh, we fly you here. Um, and then what we do is um, you're out and about with your dog learning one-on-one uh, -on -one and then also in lecture format as well. Our classes are between 18 to 24 students in a month, depending upon the instructors that we have. Um, and it's a various, um, it's various new students and retrains to make it a very balanced type of, uh, atmosphere because we like to have some good, uh, retrains in there for the new students because they end up being like mentors because when you, when it's tough and you're getting frustrated and frustrated and you had a bad day, they're the ones that really can help you through it because they have experienced it before. Um, and they, they share how it's pretty normal to have a day like that and that to hold off because the next day might be better. Um, the breeds of dogs that we choose in our organization that we've had so much success with is Labrador Retrievers, Golden Retrievers, Lab Golden Crosses and German Shepherds. Everybody says to me like, whoa, which one's better than the other? They're all good. Just like you and I, we're all different, but we're really good at something, right? And everybody has their qualities, right? And they come in all shapes and sizes. And what they do is we try to collect all the information from all the details we've gotten from your application, from your visit. And then what we do is we it's almost like match.com, right? You're going to take that information and put that person with the dog that's going to correlate with your routines. Uh, good example, if you're someone that has um, a crazy routine, you work, you live in Manhattan and you're, you're taking the transport, mass transportation and 
you're flying and you're doing. We're going to give you a dog that's going to be ready for action, very solid, sound, uh, doesn't get squeamish with noises or pigeons or people or anything, mm -hmm. right? But what we have too, though, is then we have other dogs who be like, oh my gosh, just like a person. I would never want to live in Manhattan. I want to live in the countryside. I like my paths. I like the birds, you know? So what we'll do then, if somebody has a lower, like a, but still very busy, we'll give them a dog that's going to really blossom in that area. Um, because that crazy dog that says, I want all this, all this like noise and motion is going to be very bored in the other one, right? So it's just like people, they are very much like people. So what we do is a collect that. What's great is a lot of our candidates have, um, and, and our grads have lots of hobbies that they do, some hike, some swim, some do Tai Chi, some do um, horseback riding, um, you know, so we try to make sure ahead of time that this, the dogs are pretty, really comfortable in those environments. Um, as you know, when you're in the pool area, say at a Y, it's very echoey and it's loud and they're in water. You don't want your dog jumping in with you while you're swimming. You want it to be content off to the side. Um, you know, you also have a, a person who may live on a farm or on a ranch. You have to have a dog that's gonna be pretty good around all these other animals, not chase the kitchen, the, the chickens, or um, get scared of horses, right? So we have to look at all of these things. Um, the other thing too is obviously if somebody has a special gait, we'll try to make sure that we can give a dog that's going to be pretty good with somebody who's a little more unsteady. Um, We've also had some people with prosthetics who have different types of movements, and we may have to also teach the dog to be on the opposite side. So what we'll do is we'll train the dog to be on the left versus the right. Um, so there's lots of things that we put together to make sure that we know that it's going to work properly. Um, you know, we've had a lot of uh, people that have also said, you know what, when I first applied, I didn't realize that it was gonna be this much work because it is, it's a lot of work. When you come home, you could put your cane in the corner and you're done because most of the time, you know your lay of the land in your home. But with a dog, you come home, you have to feed the dog, you have to groom, groom the dog, you have to take care of all of its expenses, but you also get a companion. You have a partner in crime, I say, you know, somebody who you gain, um, a respect that you can do things safely out there and feel more comfortable. Um, but it does have responsibility and that's important for somebody to know. Um, trying to think of different questions that people ask, um, you know, our main objective is be as, to collect as much information from other areas as possible to make sure we get to know who the person is. The applicants that come in for a dog um, that could range from 17 up to, if it's a retrain, 80 or more. It depends on how good they are and how active they are. Believe it or not, we just served somebody who has had their fifth dog and he's 85. He gets around, but he actually still has his business. He still practices law. So, and he's very proud of it. I think personally, he's told me he's afraid to retire because he, has, he wants to keep everything going. So, um, but the dogs are helping them. Um, so in regards to a student, what we've started back up again is if somebody has a younger student that's possibly thinking of it, but they haven't reached that point that they need to be an independent traveler. They need to have a routine that they go out by themselves. It's not that they're driven somewhere. They have to have enough work. Most of the time it's when a student is going to be going to college. Um, what we do is we've just started our seminar for the youth program back up and that students that are ages like 15 to 18 that can come to our school for a week, get immersed in the program, see how it feels to be um, matched with a dog and then see if that's really for them. And what was great is we brought it back this past summer and quite a few of the kids said, wow, this is crazy. This is like you have, this is a lot of work. Um, so they understood that it takes some time because some of them, it 
it ranged, we had from 16 to 18 this year. Um, some of them were like, well, you're gonna see us back and others said, I'm not sure yet. So I thought that's a very successful program then because it shows them all the different things to know if this is really right for them. Um, so we will be doing that again this year coming up because we think that's important to kind of let everyone know um, what it's like beforehand because that way they know if it's really for them or not. Um, I saw that there was a question in the chat the, before we even got started. If I have a German Shepherd or I have a dog of my own, can I bring it to you to train it? And no, we breed our own dogs. Majority of the, the training schools have their own dogs that they train. Um, you might be able to go to a small personal trainer if that's something that you want to do. I unfortunately don't know much about that, um, but I do know that, you know, we have our own breeding station and we we actually have our own geneticist and we breed and, and only utilize our own dogs. Um, trying to think if there was a couple other questions in the chat area. We do have a few more questions in the chat. Um, uh, is it helpful for a person to get a seeing eye dog before they get a job or is it helpful for a person to have a job before they get a seeing eye dog? And that's a great question. It really depends. Why do I say that? For that person, um, usually having a job is great because you have a routine, right? But if that person doesn't have it yet, um, but they're working on it and they have a set routine that they're going and doing things, um, then they can definitely apply. And then also the application process takes time. So if they're in the middle of something or in the middle of even finishing up their mobility instruction, it's okay to start applying. Um, you know, we're going to be checking all the avenues with that. The key is to not think that I'm going to get a dog so I can get the job. You have to have like, you can't, what do they say? You can't put the cart before the horse in a sense. Like sometimes some people will feel like if I get the dog, I can do more things. We need you to have those things in place or some things that you're doing so that you're out there and doing and you're feeling like you're a strong independent traveler to have a dog and be safe and successful. Heather, you would agree with that, right? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> you know, so I mean, but that's a common thing that people think though, that you would get the dog first. Um, it really depends on your routine at home because there are sometimes people that maybe they took care of the family, but then now they want to go back out to the workplace, but they still are busy because maybe this is a, a mother or father that's been bringing their, their children to different events, goes out and does shopping, goes and does volunteer work. I mean, you can do things like that and still qualify for a dog. Um, the key is just to make sure that we figure out what's that next avenue, where are you going to be planning on going so that we know that that dog is going to fit into that routine as well. And this, is also, a, uh, this is also a great time to uh, can I mention that if you are interested in gaining skills for employment, uh, that World Services for the Blind, we do have a lot of uh, career training programs as well as orientation and mobility. So you can kind of get both of those skills at the same time. Yeah. Um, and we're going to take one more question. Uh, it's from Dina, and she asks, is 17 the minimum age that you can get a dog through the seeing eye? Well, it really depends. What's interesting is we don't have too many that are younger than that, primarily because of what I mentioned. Your routine is usually not as independent. Um, we did have a couple of exceptions in the past because maybe we had a young student that had walked to school or has been advanced for their age. So they were going into different programs that might be outside of their school and they had to get to other places. Um, and was quite mature. Maturity is the key there because you are the person that's responsible for taking care of this other living being. It's not parents, it's not aunts and uncles, it's not anyone else but you. Um, so you have to be ready for that experience and, and responsibility. So if that person is 17 and they have some of these things in place, what we do is we evaluate it very closely and then we we will see if that's a good option. Absolutely. 
And just to jump in here, I would say that each um, dog at school evaluates age uh, or young age similarly. So e each school, if you were to look into each school, they all have a minimum age and they look at it um, similarly about um, whether or not they would accept someone below, at or below their minimum age for uh, a dog, to receive a dog. So you would want to look into, uh, if, if you have a child that's younger than 17, you might look into other schools to see if they might accept someone younger than 17 and whether or not they would meet your criteria or whatnot. Just like she said, it's like looking, in, looking at a college. And so there might be other schools that have different criteria that might meet similar needs. Can you, uh, just real quick, Angela, what is the, uh, I know after COVID and lots of things, some of the schools um, were having extremely long wait times um, or wait lists, or I don't know what the right term is, but like up to, to two years um, as far as getting a dog, are y'all back to a little more normalcy now as far as, um, and I know everybody's a little bit different, but the application process from beginning application process to receiving uh, an invitation to class, are y'all more normal? And what is that quote unquote normal timeline for that? Well, we definitely are still a little more backlogged. Um, it's also too with you know, the job availability and whatnot. But sure. we are definitely um, more normal. And I believe right now we're serving more students than most schools. Because like right now I have 20 students in a class right now. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty darn good. Um, yeah. So what that, and they're all all ages. It's exciting actually. Um, so, um, so with that wait time, if you said to me, okay, I put in an application, it, it, could, it could really vary. It could be a year, could be a year and uh, three months. It could be less than that. It just depends on three things. One is the application process, you're depending upon a lot of other avenues, like your, your ophthalmologist sending information. We actually ask for a medical report. So the other schools, we look for a physical because we want to make sure everybody is right on target and you're residing here. So we want to make sure we know who you are on a physical place too, so that if something happens, we know how to take care of you. Um, so we we review all those things, but it takes time for these other, you're depending on other people sending stuff in. So if your references are pretty quick, the mobility instructor is um, pretty quick, these other things, then I've had somebody get in their, their application within a month, like the actual, like all the information to me, that's pretty impressive because you yeah. have a lot of places that you're depending on, you know, to get in the information. Um, and then we put them on the visit list and it just takes a little bit of time for us to get somebody out there. Um, other schools will sometimes ask for um, videos. We don't do videos unless somebody says, hey, I have one done. I'll say, sure, you can send it on over. The more we know about <laughs> you, the better, absolutely. But we will still send people out. Um, and then what we do is it takes a little bit of time for matching. But what's interesting is I love to pleasantly surprise people, which we just did, or like we're starting to invite students for our October 23rd class. Um, and this person was very excited because she was recently accepted and it just mattered about the match. Sometimes it matters about that match. And what I'm going to tell whoever is interested in getting a dog, you need to try to get yourself pretty in shape for the fact that you are going to be handling a dog. So no matter how calm that dog is, you're still working and holding onto a harness handle and you're traveling through uh, different types of uh, terrain. So it's going to take a toll on your body. We always recommend do some, get yourself exercising, get your stamina up get yourself stronger in your arms because it will help you because 
just like when you start working out in the beginning, you're like all achy, right? Because you might start using some muscles you never did before because you're utilizing a harness handle and you're walking at a pace that's maybe even a little bit um, different than what you did with a cane because it's smoother. Um, so I always tell people, keep yourself out there keep working on your mobility and your orientation and try to keep yourself in shape. And unfortunately, through COVID, I don't know if any of you real, you know, notice this too. We noticed that a lot of people's stamina and their fitness had dropped a lot. We had people coming into class that we might have visited um, prior to and got them in finally. And they were slightly different because of the lack of activity. So that would be my advice there um, in regards to that. Something else I just want to add real quick um, as you're talking about that, it made me think, um, and what Lee was asking a question earlier, but that I always tell clients when they're applying or I'm assisting them in applying, uh, every application that I've helped someone fill out it asks, do you have a preference for dog type? Or oh, I'm different? so glad you said that. Thank you. And I always, always, always tell my clients to say no. So, uh, and my reason for that is if you may, if you state a preference for a dog type, if you say, yes, I want a golden retriever then you are more likely going to wait a much, much, much longer time to get your dog because now they have to find a dog, a golden retriever to match your personality. And that is going to take much longer than just finding a dog to match your personality. And so, yes, that, that question is on the application, but I employ you as someone who may be interested in getting a dog <laughs> to say, no, you don't care what kind of dog you get. I'm going to tell so, you, God bless you. <laughs> because that is definitely, so if you said what causes some people to have a more lengthy wait time, it's exactly those reasons. People will say, I want a specific breed, specific gender, specific color, a specific size. So just like anything, we need to get your match, your pace, your strength, your pull, your um, and then everything else around you and what you do. So if you might, we might have a rock star of a dog, but it may not be that breed that you said. So it then it passes you by and then somebody else gets that rock star of a dog. So the more selective, the longer it takes because of that reason. So thank and you. And unfortunately, we as the general population don't have any idea what's the best dog for <laughs> us. I mean, you may think that you want a, a, a golden retriever or whatever, but that may not be the best dog for you right. because of your size, your weight, your speed, your whatever, that you may need a different kind of dog because that dog has a better demeanor or whatever. And so that's what I encourage my clients to keep in mind when they are completing these applications. So those of you who are on this call, just keep those things in mind as you complete the application that you may think that's what you want for whatever reason, but remember that the people who are making these matches do this for a living Thank and you. they know how to match you with the dog and the dog with you. Yeah, they actually enjoy it. I mean, it to them, yeah. it's wonderful and to see it come into fruition and to see it grow through the class like the relationship is just it's it's wonderful to see um so that is so wonderful that to be able to be open um because that's what we do so a good thing you had mentioned even before i mean i could be a person that works in a cubicle right so not every dog is going to want to stay underneath a little desk or i could be someone who works <laughs> in a factory right that i have to be underneath like a a table where there's lots of noise and packing or whatnot so i mean let us figure those things out because maybe um you know it, it just makes so much more sense but i get it 
today you can go on Amazon and you can order whatever you want and it's here tomorrow, <laughs> right? So sometimes like I actually ordered something and it came the same day and I was like, I didn't need it the same day, but it came the same day. So we're all trained to get that immediate gratification and also be very selective. Um, so unfortunately it's, it's kind of like hard to kind of step back, um, but it would be good to, to be able to do so because it's really helpful. Well, we are about running out of time, um, but thank you so much to TJ, Heather, and Angela. This has been such a great and informative webinar. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. And if um, anyone has any questions, please feel free to email me. I put it in the chat, but my email is lrogers at wsblind.org, and we will get your questions out to the right people. Um, and we'll also be sending out a recording of this webinar. Great. Hey, Lee, one more thing I wanted to mention. Um, I think it's important, and, I, and I, I think some other schools do this too, but when a lot of people ask me if once they get the dog, is that it? And I'm like, well, no. With the school, you become a graduate of our program. You become part of our family. So you take care of your family. So once you get back out there in, in your own environment, you're probably going to have questions because... Maybe you're doing, you're working to a certain area and it's not too good today, but it was fine for two weeks ago. Um, you can call in and ask for a training manager and they could say, all right, hey Lee, what's going on? What can we do to help? And then they do that and they give suggestions. If something is really not good, then what we do is we send somebody out there. You know, if there's anything that changes or there's, we, I, I called recently, uh, a gentleman that's reapplying and I called him back and it was the cutest thing. I called him when he was in the, he just got out of the delivery room. His wife just had a baby. He picked up the phone and I'm like, oh my gosh, he was so excited. Like I get excited. It's like you become like, you know, these people, but communication, no matter where you go is so important. Um, so I'm sure all of you know that the more, like we don't call out to say, hey, how are you doing? You call in and then we're gonna we're going to be there for you because we respect your independence um, and your personal life. Um, but to know that somebody's got your back is important, especially in this time and in this day and age. And I, I would like to explain that because you know, when you get a dog or when you get anything, you should have that follow-up. You should be able to have somebody that you can depend on. And that to me is really important. And that's what our organization do, it does and it's been doing for years. So I just needed to say that because sometimes, you know, people don't realize that because it's not a done deal. This is a new relationship. So we're here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to TJ and Angela. This has been some really great information. And I know this has been beneficial for everybody. And now I need to go find Hank and pet him because we've been talking about bad dogs for an hour. So <laughs> thank you everybody for joining us. Um, if you need any information, please put some information in the chat about how you can contact us. But you can also look at our website at wsblind.org. And we hope to see you next month.